The 60s and 70s were an exciting time for Northern Irish football fans. The name George Best was cemented in the hearts of local fans. His legacy lives in the hometown saying, Maradona good, Pele better, George Best. Known mainly for his 11 years at Manchester United, George played for more than 15 clubs in a 21 year career. He passed away in 2005 after battling alcoholism for most of his adult life. George Best was born on the 22nd of May 1946 in Craigar, a district in southeast Belfast which is centred on the Craigar Road. His hometown of Belfast is the capital and largest city of Northern Ireland. He grew up in the Craigar Estate, where as a boy he would play football on the open playing fields in the middle of the estate. He was discovered at the age of 15 in Belfast by Manchester United scout Bob Bishop. He eventually rose to fame, wowing crowds with his pace, acceleration and poise. He was considered academically gifted in his early school years and equally gifted on the pitch. He was dubbed the fifth Beatle for his mop top good looks, similar celebrity profile and rock star lifestyle. However, life in the fast lane soon led to the alcoholism which would eventually claim his life. On the pitch, however, George lived up to his profile. Playing as a winger or attacking midfielder, his clubs enjoyed his attacking strides and prolific goal scoring. He earned his reputation as one of the stars of the game. He played in Manchester United's youth squad for two years, after Bob sent a telegram to United manager Matt Busby saying, I think I've found you a genius. Young George was elevated to the senior squad in 1963, where he played until 1974. George Best made his senior debut for Manchester United against West Bromwich Albion on the 14th of September 1963, aged just 17. His age kept him out of the senior side for the first half of the season. However, he was given more opportunities after the new year and finished the season with 17 league appearances, as United claimed second place. The next year was more successful for both parties, with Man U winning the league title and George making 41 appearances. His profile took off from there, peaking between 1966 and 1968. His club won the league title again in 67 and took out the European Cup the following year. George was crowned European Footballer of the Year in 1968. But after a stellar 67-68 season, his troubles began. He developed problems with gambling, alcohol and women. His private life problems didn't have an immediate impact on his playing career, however. Over the next few seasons, he continued to be the club's top scorer. On the football pitch, he was a virtuoso. His light frame and devastating pace afforded him incredible ball control. Able to play off both feet, he terrorised defences, continually thwarting the opposition with his divine skills. Along with Bobby Charlton and Dennis Law, George formed part of the powerhouse United side, which had been rebuilt after the infamous Munich air disaster of 1958. George's amazing skill and showmanship brought crowds flooding through the gates. He popularised the sport amongst the wider community, taking it beyond the bounds of the working class. He sparked interest among all types of people, increasing attendance at Old Trafford by a whopping 15,000 fans a game. But as his fame grew, so did his taste for the high life. And after Matt Busby retired as manager in 1969, 
he sank into decline. He began acting up in games and skipping practice sessions. After knocking the ball out of a referee's hands after what he believed to be a bad call, new manager Wolf McGuinness suspended him for a month. His drinking began to affect his performance and his time at United was coming to an end. He played his last game on the 1st of January 1974 after 470 appearances for the club. George Best earned 37 caps for his national side from 1964 to 1977, but Northern Ireland could not compete with the standard of football played at Manchester United. George was never able to lift the team to World Cup qualification. Perhaps his most famous international appearance was against England on the 15th of May 1971. In his hometown of Belfast, George set the crowd alight when, as English goalkeeper Gordon Banks attempted to kick the ball downfield, he managed to get his foot to the ball just as Banks was releasing it, sending it over Banks' head towards the open goal. He then beat Banks to the ball, heading it into the goal. However, much to the disappointment of the home crowd, the goal was disallowed by referee Alistair McKenzie. George continued to gain selection throughout the 70s, despite his fluctuating form and off-field indiscretions. His international career came to an end in 1977. George's hard partying lifestyle and off-field exploits were almost as famous as his actions on the pitch. He represented a new kind of football star. With his brooding looks, priceless talent and extravagant off-field life, he became a regular in the newspapers and tabloids. He not only appealed to football fans, but to the wider public, who were fascinated by the goings-on in his private life. He was a marketing goldmine, with all kinds of merchandise from t-shirts to mugs sporting his face. At his peak, fans from all over the world were sending in as many as 10,000 letters a week. He played hard and partied harder, but as many a rock star has found out, sooner or later, the lifestyle catches up with you. George's drinking became a problem. It caused him to be late to training, which got him into trouble with longtime coach Sir Matt Busby. Just about now, George Best will be arriving back in Manchester. He'll be 12 hours late for the training session he should have attended with the rest of his team this morning and for the much publicised confrontation or showdown with his team manager. The Irish International was due to meet Sir Matt Busby to explain his actions over the last few days. Those in charge at Manchester United became increasingly frustrated with his erratic behaviour. Can you tell us why it all came undone when it looked so good at one time? I spoke to you just before you joined her, and you seemed very happy with it all. Yeah, well, George Best will be going back to Manchester by car later tonight. At lunchtime tomorrow, he says he'll be going to see the boss, who's Sir Matt Busby. He's going to phone him at the cliff, which is United's training ground, to arrange this meeting with him. With his future hanging in the balance, George apologised to Matt Busby. Well, not only uh, in saying he's sorry, he's prepared to make a gesture of good intent by agreeing to the condition that I've laid down this morning. Do you think he has been under considerable pressure in the last few weeks or not? Are there genuine pressures on him? He, he, he has had some problems, yes, and um, uh, I've been trying to help him with those, but they, they tend to get on top of George more than anybody else, and instead of facing them, he tends to opt out a little bit. Uh, this is something that's powerful for George, and uh, it's something he's aware of, and something that we must try and continually help him to overcome. And he doesn't wish to leave Manchester United either. He wants to continue playing for Manchester United. After going back on a decision to leave the club, he returned to training with his teammates, hoping to reclaim his old form. However, he was never able to recapture it. George should have been reaching his prime, but with so much going on off the field, such as aspiring gambling problem, he never appeared fully committed. His club and the rest of the world would soon discover that far from being behind him, his troubles were only just beginning. Back in the headlines for all the wrong reasons, he was charged with drink driving, disappointing the many fans who had hoped to see their hero back in form on the pitch. It wasn't to be. In his defence, Mr Philip Havers described how Bess had been an alcoholic for several years. He was extremely remorseful and terrified at the prospect of prison. 
It received a very nasty shock indeed and appeared to have learned his lesson. He's making strenuous and quite dramatic efforts to overcome an alcohol problem and I don't really think prison's the best place for it. He is appalled at the prospect, as I think perhaps any ordinary guy, which is what George basically is, would be. I mean, it's not, it's not a circumstance with which he's terribly familiar and he's, he's a pretty worried man at the moment, there's no question about that. George's focus was by now far removed from football. Instead, his biggest concern became avoiding a prison sentence. He professed his remorse to the court and the cameras. Well, obviously, it's like any, anyone who drinks the morning after, you always feel sorry, but it's, uh, it's, it's always too late the morning after. So it's now up to me to, to knuckle down and, and sort my own problems out. By now, George's battle with the bottle was old news. It led to numerous controversies and indiscretions throughout his career. His drinking problem was made all the more sad when his mother Anne died from an alcohol-related illness in 1978. Unfortunately, George didn't learn from his mother's mistakes, and despite his best efforts, he copped a jail sentence for the drink driving charge. After his release from prison, he explained to the media that he had paid for his crimes and wanted that to be the end of it, though he still felt he'd been treated harshly. I, I did something that was wrong and I had, to, I had to pay for it. I think I was a little bit punished, a little bit heavy. Uh, but, uh, as I say, not a very pleasant experience, but it's all behind me now. It's, it's over and done with, and, and hopefully uh, I'd like to think I've learned a little bit from it. In 1974, George left the club where he made all his fortunes and earned his reputation. After worsening form due to his alcoholism and other off-field exploits, he left Old Trafford a shadow of the former hero who joined the club at 17. Despite reneging on a previous decision to leave the club, this time, there would be no second thoughts. You've had a night to think about it. You're still definitely quitting football? Yes, definitely, yeah. I made the decision and that's it, yeah. You went back <laughs> on that decision once? Yes, well, I explained that in the letter I wrote to the board Why well, I came back. A lot of people had asked me and uh, I reconsidered it and thought I'd have another go, but it just didn't work out, so this one is final. After 11 years, George Best and Manchester United finally parted ways. If George was treated uh, a little bit favourably, obviously the players wouldn't like it. We're, we're glad. I'm not glad to see the batter George Best. I'd much rather he, he'd stayed and played well for us and tried hard and got us out of the trouble, but um, it wasn't to be. For more than a decade at Manchester United, he'd enjoyed incredible highs and endured staggering lows. He was a favourite son, but he had wandered down a dangerous path, and in the end, he strayed too far from the fold. Although he'd clearly lost his once sparkling form, when he left United, he was still only 28 years old, an age at which most players reach their peak. He went on to play for a host of other teams, but never stayed at one club for more than a few seasons. He eventually retired in 1984 after playing a couple of games for a number of clubs as publicity stunts. George's lavish lifestyle eventually caught up with him. His alcohol addiction had done so much to damage his internal organs that in 2001, doctors declared he needed a liver transplant to stay alive. It was devastating news for George. This is the lowest point. Uh, I went to prison and I wasn't dying. This time I was. Once, once, you can't get any lower than that. The first sign of his failing health had come earlier in the year when he was hospitalised with pneumonia. However, the latest news struck a blow to all football fans across the globe. And once again, George Best was talk of the town for all the wrong reasons. As his health continued to deteriorate, a donor became available in August 2002 and Manchester United's favourite son went under the knife for a liver transplant. To everyone's delight, the operation was a success. It's nice to think that, well, I personally have been given a new start. And uh, with a bit of luck, a couple of kids, and get back to a little bit of normality. While George's idea of normality may have been different from that of most people, 
he was grateful for the second chance and understood what had to be done to repay the favour. You know, it's not only you know, old fools like me who need new liveries, it's, there's a lot of children involved and a lot of people on waiting lists that, that, that desperately need help and uh, hopefully this will make people a lot more aware of what, what's exactly needed for, for uh, the work in, in, involved in liver. With his history of alcoholism, the last thing George should have been thinking about was reuniting with his old destructive friend. But sadly, the lure of the liquor was just too great. And in 2003, he was spotted drinking white wine spritzers in public. Controversy erupted and the English tabloids cried outrage. After receiving his liver transplant, everyone assumed that George would lay off the booze. However, Professor Roger Williams explained that a relapse wasn't out of the ordinary for someone who suffers from alcoholism. And here we have a lapse on George's part, which in a way is almost inevitable as part of the condition. We have a, a lapse. Uh, we don't even know how much he's been drinking and really it's as though the whole of the world has exploded. However, the professor's wise words didn't stem the flow of the community's disappointment in George. Even the publican who'd served him was in the firing line. I just sat down with a member of uh, George's family on Friday night and I was explaining the situation and uh, obviously things have changed then. Um, now I know the situation um, and for a family reason I've decided not to uh, serve George alcohol anymore. Concerns over George's health raised their head once again. Those close to him, who not so long ago had witnessed his miraculous recovery, were now fearing the worst. His ex-wife Alex helplessly watched him self-destruct. I feel awful for the family of the person who died to save George. The last week has been hell. He seems to be on a mission to self-destruct and it's getting worse. Sadly, Alex could do nothing as George continued to drink himself to the grave. He loves life too much and he has been told that by well, the top professor in the world that if he does have a drink then he will die. The condition of the once invincible George continued to worsen. His health went downhill on a daily basis and he was hospitalised in October 2005 with a kidney infection. Despite showing initial signs of recovery, he couldn't fight off the infection and just over a month after being admitted, his death was announced on November 20, 2005. Tributes from his former teammates flooded in. He was the original superstar and he was such a, a well-mannered, humble person and that, that was George, even though he had this superstar you know, status, he was well-mannered, he was humble, he, he was really, really a shy person. You know, no, no matter what his, uh, his public image was, he was a really shy, lovely, lovely lad, super lad. His funeral, which was attended by hundreds and thousands of fans, was held at the Stormont Government Building in Northern Ireland. Sad to say that if he was here, he would be delighted the way that the Manchester people are uh, going to celebrate him. Along with the fans, past and present greats of the game paid their respect to Northern Ireland's most famous export. George will always be known for Manchester United, not for anybody else. I mean, it's just sad that when you think the great player that he was, and Jimmy Johnson as well, another great player who's getting buried tomorrow. You know, just two great players, and they both knew each other as well, and both respected each other's ability, and two fantastic players. Alex also said her final farewell at the service with the aid of a poem. We won't forget our Belfast boy. You filled our lives with so much joy. Your star will shine now in the sky. Farewell, our friend, but not goodbye. Although he had had his controversial exploits off the pitch, nobody could deny George Best's place in the history of football and his entitlement to a statue in his honour. To be fair, his private life wasn't all about partying and drinking. After a failed marriage to Angela MacDonald Jaynes that ended in 1986, he married former air hostess and model Alex Percy. 
Despite being 26 years his junior, Alex and George seemed to be a good fit for each other and married in 1995 at the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, London. Although it has been reported that George was violent towards her throughout the marriage, Alex stayed with the former football champion for nine years until their 2004 divorce. The issue of George's violence during their marriage was tackled in a biography entitled Bestie, in which Alex claimed she had been punched in the face by George on more than one occasion. George never denied the claim. Bestie, which was released in 1998 and co-written with Joe Lovejoy, is just one of the many books written about one of the most recognised footballers on the planet. However, Alex wasn't the only one of his exes to dish up dirt on Best and reveal his dark secrets in print. His first wife, Angie, released an autobiography in 2001, titled George and Me. Using her ex-husband's famous name to sell copies of her book, Angie provided an unflinching insight into George's decline from top flight football into alcoholism. She also wrote of her own battle to rebuild her life after their divorce. With a life story to rival a Hollywood blockbuster, George remains a figure of great fascination to all football fans and the general public alike. Thus, it's easy to understand why there have been so many books written about the gifted midfielder. So far, more than 30 different books about George Best have found their way onto the shelves. The very first one, Best of Both Worlds, was published in 1968. Information on George was in such high demand by fans that he was given his own football annual, which ran for five years between 1968 and 1972. Books about the boy from Belfast continued to flood the shelves of bookstores right up until his death. His last ever autobiography was released just days before he was admitted into hospital in 2005. It was called Hard Tackles and Dirty Baths, the inside story of football's golden era. Sadly, it was this love for everything to do with George Best that may in some way have contributed to his early death. Becoming football's first megastar, he had no one to look to in terms of a positive role model. Although his activities off the field will never be forgotten, there is no denying his achievements on the football pitch. In his prime, he was unquestionably the best, and his legacy to the game will remain forever.